Okay. Well, it's in doubt. I guess uh, some people have taken off early for uh, her spring break. Anybody going to Palm Springs? The party? Uh, well, I hope you're, someone's going somewhere. Well, I'm going somewhere, so I'll see you. We're going to go over um, kind of a review and then uh, on to gene expression. So we all know what an allele is. It's a version of a gene. Um, since we're diploid, we have homologous chromosomes, one from mom and dad. Therefore, we have an allele of the gene, let's say of one version from mom and one from dad. They could be the same version or they could be a different version. So let's see, which, um, which pattern can't belong to the child? So here's mom. And uh, here's and then and then here's dad. Okay, so let's see. Which one is it? <coughs> Which one has two red circles? <coughs> see, um, <coughs> if that's mom's allele. She's got two of them, right? Uh, she's donating one, but this number C is a child that has uh, the same allele as his mom. Now, maybe the child is blown, but otherwise, it's not the child of the couple. <coughs> we'll do it again. Dad. Dad. Well, we don't know yet. Um, Okay, so um, we've got two double bands here on C and D. In other words, they're the same allele. But uh, on D, uh, if you go over and you look at Dad, that's, a, that's one of Dad's alleles, but there's no mom there. So it has to be D. Uh, what kind of cell is this? Eukaryotic cell. And why is why is it, why is it a eukaryotic cell? Yeah. Who are these guys?
Okay. Um, now, what's the complement for C? G. For G? Okay, good. Um, okay, so... Basically, this is what happens on when a cell is replicating itself. DNA, we're going to get into this with mitosis much more. But, um, the enzyme uh, splits apart the DNA molecule, actually, and then the DNA polymerase actually adds um, the complements to it. <coughs> Okay. Why did I put those there? Uh, okay. It's PCR. So if you take a very small amount, let's say a couple of cells of DNA of uh, cells, you get the DNA out of it, you can amplify it to millions of copies. Okay. Okay. And then PCR is R. Highly variable repetitive DNA sequences that differ in the number of repeats between individuals. If you use a, a bunch of different STRs, there's all, there won't be any person, um, or the probability of having two people on Earth having the same repeats is almost vanish, it's vanishingly small. Uh, gel electrophoresis. <laughs> We've got these STR fragments. We put them in the different wells up at the top. Uh, let's say one of the wells is a uh, sample we recovered from the crime scene. And then the next two are two suspects. We apply electrical charge. Um, the fragments move down. If they're heavy and long, they don't move as far. If they're light and shorter, like eight versus two, so two is shorter, they travel more quickly and farther down. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, there are 20 amino acids. So we'll say first base. Okay. Okay, so first base, second position. and third position. So remember our codon is three base pairs in the DNA code, and that encodes an amino acid. Now it turns out this amino acid, uh, there's a, it's actually a redundant code. <coughs> so sometimes you can have a different codon, but still get the same amino acid. Um, and this is especially true in the third base pair. So if you look at right here, that's arginine. Each of these, and this is, uh, we're using here the um, RNA code because we ex we have inserted, um, substituted U for T. Um, so it would be CGU or CGC or CGA or CGG. By varying the last one, we still get the same 
DNA uh, amino acid. Usually, uh, it's not quite like that um, with first and second substitutions. Okay. <coughs> Um, a chromosome is about 3 billion base pairs long, or a total gen uh, genome, all the chromosomes. So a chromosome is millions of base pairs long. Much of the genome it was thought that was junk, and some still is. Um, they can be like transposons, which are DNA. <coughs> Uh, sequences that can copy themselves throughout the genome, uh, or pseudogenes that were genes that were functional once but aren't anymore. But there's about 19 or 20,000 genes that actually code for the DNA, and that's about two percent of uh, all the DNA. So when this was discovered, there was a big push to actually um, understand, uh, sequence the whole human genome. Uh, people at the time thought, oh, there's, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of genes because there's hundreds of thousands of proteins. Well, it wasn't that way. There's only 19 or 20,000 genes, in other words, DNA that actually codes for a protein. And it turns out that um, instead of this one-to-one -one correspondence, you can, genes are often many, many thousands of base pairs long, you can do what's called, called alternative splicing and get variation on proteins. So you can get a lot more proteins per gene than just what people originally thought. Now, a gene, in other words, the DNA, DNA doesn't do anything. All it is, is a way to encode information. We can do, we can use other things to encode information. Um, we do it all the time with, uh, let's say, writing, or with mathematics, or ideas that we pass along to one another. Um, but in terms of in terms of actually an organism, we use DNA. But the DNA is then has to be transcribed and translated into a protein. Okay. So now remember each of these amino acids um, is coded for an amino acid by a codon, which is three triplet pair of nucleotides. And they're strung together into the complete protein. So, this is the overview of gene expression. Uh, We've got our DNA. We can then turn it into an mRNA, which is a complement to one of these strands. The U has been substituted for T, but it's basically the same thing. Then that RNA is translated into amino acids and the whole protein. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so what we have is we start
Okay, so <clears throat> this is a three-step process. Uh, mRNA, it's called M because it's called messenger RNA. The RNA uh, that's seized by the ribos ribosome is called tRNA, as in transfer RNA. So this is the sequence that it always goes from. You have the DNA code, it is transcribed into mRNA that is ferried out of the nucleus through a, a protein pore into the cytoplasm where it locks in with the ribosome and then with these transfer RNAs with an amino acid attached to it are then strung together into a natural protein. That's called translation. So transcribe means like to write or to transfer information from one place to another. To translate, to turn one language into another or to translate wishes into deeds, let's say. Uh, on the left we have a muscle cell and on the right we have a nerve cell. Does each cell have just the genes that it needs, or the whole genome? In other words, all the chromosomes, or just the, the genes that it needs? Anybody? All of them. All of them, right. So that means the correct genes have to be expressed for different cell types. Okay. It's um, the DNA. It's not really. It's an instruction manual, but it's um, it's actually an instruction manual that interacts with the environment, whether it's the cellular environment or the organ environment of the whole organism or the outer environment. So it's not like 
It's all genes that make you. Um, and depending on what kind of cell it is, uh, it will, some genes will be more strongly expressed than others. So of course, we have one copy of each, we get an allele from mom, an allele from dad, could be the same allele, could be different. So I go to courses the diploid um, fertilized egg. So <clears throat> here we have muscle cell. Um, we have gene A. Each of those um, green dots is a copy of that protein. You have that RNA that's been transcribed from the DNA into the mRNA, and then it's translated with the ribosome into the actual protein. So you have that much transcription and translation. It can vary. So for gene B, it codes for protein B. In this case, we have one RNA transcript and we end up with a couple of molecules of protein B. A transcription of C, um, three mRNAs, and then we have these protein C. Um, and a certain amount. In this case, we'll say that gene D, whatever it is, and whatever protein it, it makes, is not being expressed. Okay. With a neuron, it, um, in this case, gene A is translated into the same amount of protein as uh, in muscle cells. So this might be a housekeeping gene that all genes need the protein to do their function. In this case with the neuron, we'll say <clears throat> gene B is not being expressed. Gene C and the corresponding protein is transcribed in translated, but in a different amount. And then, this gene is now expressed, gene D, for protein D, with this amount. Okay. Yeah. Are there always going to be four genes for each cell type, or is it just like an example of how many What? Are there always going to be four genes, like A, B, C, D, for each No. No, no, yeah. There's actually um, thousands of genes. Okay, so this is just an example of how things are expressed. But um, some genes are going to use the same gene, whatever we call it. Um, you can actually, I mean, there's a whole list of genes, and they know what their function does now. Um, and then. Let's say for the A, it might be a certain gene for housekeeping, for doing a certain function that all cells need to be doing. And then there's all these specific ones. And then the genes are expressed differently at different times, too. So it's not like there are always uh, that much protein is made. And as I mentioned, um, when when the whole genome project was done, they expected to find hundreds of thousands of genes. And they were shocked when there was only 19 or 20,000. They thought, well, how can this be? Well, they thought that you'd have one gene for one protein. That's not the case. It turns out that our genome, each of these genes can be, um, have what's called alternate splicing. 
So you can get different forms of the same gene, but different proteins. They might be related to each other, but that have much different functions. Okay. Now, to be expressed, um, DNA sequences have to be controlled with, uh, and regulated, called gene expression. There are enhancers, are DNA regulatory sequences that actually can be far from the protein coding sequence. In fact, they can enhance it if they could be on another chromosome. And then there are promoters, which are just upstream, right next to the gene, that also are used uh, to express genes, and that way get a certain amount of protein. So, the question is, does the promoter region act as an on-off switch? No. That's like a dimmer. Or, if it's, uh, we're talking about an electric thing, it's called, um, oh, what is it called? Uh, oh, I forget. Anyway, so instead of on-off, you turn it, let's say, to the my right or your right, you get more and more and more protein. Okay? Or less. Or you can turn it all the way off. Um, the amount of protein that is actually made depends on, let's say, the environment to a certain extent. So, let's say you have a mammal, and it's um, a little baby that's feeding off its mother and getting milk. It needs a certain enzyme to break down that milk. It's called lactase. Um, the lactase uh, is breaking down lactose into glucose and galactose, and that's how you actually get ATP. Um, when the mother is making milk, uh, the baby doesn't need to drink all the time, and so this promoter region actually affects how much of the enzyme is made. So if the baby is drinking milk, um, the promoter region is actually triggered by the amount of um, lactose molecules that it comes in contact with, and then ups the amount of lactase. Once baby is weaned, and does not drink the mother's milk anymore, doesn't need it anymore, so the promoter region then shuts down, because it's not coming in contact with the lactose um, a molecule, and it's no longer making black cakes, because that would be expensive, and there'd be selection against that. Now, with humans, of course, some humans are very good at, at um, drinking milk and, and breaking it down, and they need the lactase gene. In that case, there's been um, a mutation in the promoter region, not the gene, structural gene itself for the enzyme, but the promoter region, that keeps it producing lactase, because those individuals that have that can then drink milk and get um, a lot of energy and fats and all sorts of things from it, and otherwise you couldn't get that. So normally it would be selected against, but in humans there have been three instances in three different populations where those populations all had that mutation, but it was a slightly different mutation in the promoter region. Okay. So, the part of the gene that actually codes for the amino acids is in the coding region, not the promoter region. The promoter region just regulates gene expression. So, here we are. Um, this, of course, is the lactase molecule. It's an enzyme. It's got two active sites. 
when it locks on to lactose, they go into those sites and then they're split apart into glucose and galactose. So, that ends with most mammals after a certain amount of time and then the animal is ready to go off and start eating solid food. Okay. So this transcription, um, we see where the promoter region is um, on the left, and that's actually regulating gene expression. And the promoters have these nucleotide sequences that the RNA polymerase, which is the part that um, makes the mRNA, recognizes and attach and binds to. And then there's all these mRNA nucleotides that are strung together um, as that RNA polymerase is running along the DNA, one strand of it, and reading it. So this is the messenger RNA. So you can only go from DNA to RNA um, to a protein, you can't go back the other way. Okay, you can't take a protein, I mean we can certainly look at a protein and we can sequence it and see what the DNA would be, but in terms of what the body can actually do, it's a one-way street. And then in the translation, we have that ribosome, which is um, an RNA molecule attached to proteins. And it takes uh, the translation, it reads the mRNA and then attaches to these tRNAs in yellow. And each one is attached to a specific amino acid. So, like for UCC, that's amino acid ARG. Now the DNA for that was originally um, TCC, but remember that's DNA, RNA has a U instead of a T. And as each of these amino acids is attached, then you have this long polypeptide, that's the actual protein. So this is the transfer RNA. It takes, as the mRNA is being read by the ribosome, these RNAs with the amino acid attached to them are then run through and strung together based on that code. So the codon, in this case, is UUU, um, and then the anticodon is AAA, because we've substituted U for T. Okay. Now, as we mentioned, as I mentioned, a codon is three base pairs long. Um, let's see, we've got, in the first position, uh, we can either have a T, a C, an A, or a G. In the second position, we can have the same thing. And then third position, <coughs> the same sort of thing. So, and what I mean by position, I mean, there's one position, the second position of the codon, and the third position. And there are more combinations than amino acids, so some amino acids are redundant. You can get the same amino acid from the same code, from different codons. That most often happens when you change the third position. For example, right here, arginine, you've changed UCA 
A and G for the third position all get the same amino acid. Okay. So remember, our DNA is the, the code for our traits that are translated into proteins. Um, here's our DNA coding for these things. And we um, have, like on our tongue, we have different areas that are sensitive to certain kinds of tastes. Uh, sour, bitter, salty, sweet, um, also called savory. They're all made up of protein receptors that are different. They're similar proteins, but they're slightly different receptors, so they, um, we can differentiate tastes. Now, sometimes you can get what's called a mutation, of course. So, this is the hemoglobin molecule. If we look at this, we see that we've got the nucleotide on top, and then the amino acid on the bottom. Let's see. This is nice and round. Uh, that's an red blood cell, a healthy looking one. There's something called um, sickle cell anemia. And we get a different kind of hemoglobin. And unfortunately, if you get two copies of that allele, like one from each parent, it's called HBS, Normal is HBA, so you might have HBA, HBA, that's normal hemoglobin, HBS, HBS. Sickle cell anemia, that means it's pretty bad. But if you have HBA, HBS, those individuals are actually um, somewhat immune to malaria and the malaria parasite. Uh, they're Slightly, so the hemoglobin they have is a combination of good and bad. Those individuals can survive, but it's hard for the plasmodium, the um, malarial parasite, to get into the red blood cells. And it's all just because of one amino acid substitution. In this case, uh, it was GAG with glucine, and only one thing has changed. And now we have GTG instead, and then it's now valine. Okay. So we're going to um, now talk about genetically unmodified organisms. There's been a great debate about, about genetically modified organisms. So first I'm just going to take you through what they are. Um, on the left, we have um, a transgenic, uh, genetically modified goat, and then on the right, some corn. And each of these uh, organisms have genes that they don't normally have. They've been they've been inserted into the genome. Okay. So, okay, so which cell type in your body contains the gene that encodes your photoreceptors? Mm -hmm. What's the name of the dimmer switch? Yeah. So what are the main steps that go from DNA to the protein? Exactly. So 
the DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA that's figured out of the nucleus uh, into the cytoplasm where it connects with the ribosome and then that transcript is then read and translated into amino acids for the protein. So if we insert a human gene into a bacterial cell, uh, the correct protein won't be made because the genetic code is different between bacteria and humans. Is that true or false? It's 50-50, isn't it? Just say something. Anybody? False. I heard a false. That's, that's absolutely true. And it's because bacteria and us, we share the same exact genetic code. In other words, we once shared a common ancestor with bacteria billions of years ago. Uh, and why don't we have bacteria that make proteins? Well, we do. So, human insulin. Insulin is part of the glucose metabolism where glucose, uh, when it's metabolized, you end up with ATP. To do it, effectively, you need oxygen. And, um, glucose, and then you end up with ATP and CO2. Okay. Now, diabetics, especially type 1, but type 2 also, um, diabetics either don't produce enough insulin or they're resistant to insulin. So, sometimes they need more. Um, it used to be that we would harvest insulin from horses, from the blood of horses. But, some people would uh, get, um, they'd have a reaction to it, so they couldn't use it. So now we actually take the human insulin gene and we insert it into bacterial DNA. We can grow huge, huge vats of the bacteria. Those bacteria are producing the insulin. And then we can take the soup and um, <coughs> harvest the insulin right out of it. And it's actually hin human insulin and give it to people. So it's less expensive, uh, better for patients, and of course, horses are happier. Now, the name of an organism that has a gene from another organism is called transgenic. In other words, the bacteria, let's say, that produces the insulin, it has a human gene inserted into the bacteria. So this is actually called recombinant insulin. The right kind of insulin, but it's produced by an organism that normally wouldn't do it. Uh, there's um, a clotting factor called antithrombin. Uh, if you don't, if you have a mistake, mutation in it, you end up with someone who's um, hemophiliac. That means they don't have proper clotting factor and they can bleed to death. So we normally have an antithrombin gene, but if there's a, a bad copy with a mutated copy, that individual is in real problems. It's a, a recessive gene, that means they both, uh, they get both bad copies, one from mom, one from dad. 
And in the past, they were in trouble. But nowadays, we can um, get antithrombin. Uh, in the past, we get it from we could harvest it from human blood, but now we can use transgenic goats to actually produce the. So these GMO goats are transgenic organisms. Now, if you wanted to get the antithrombin, what might be? Oh God! What might be the best place? What cell type might be the best cell type to insert these uh, this antithrombin gene into? Any ideas? You still got a good goat. You don't have to chop it up or anything. You don't actually have to take its blood, but if you put it into mammary cells, you can get the goat to actually produce the antithrombin in the milk. So you've created this hybrid gene through recombinant DNA technology and with something called CRISPR, uh, which we'll get to. So you take the goat promoter region and you attach it then to the gene that encodes antithrombin. You then take a microinjection and transfer from um, the antithrombin in the, in the uh, nucleus, into a new nucleus, into the cell you take that cell and plant it into the goat. The goat gives rise to little goats, and the little goats are now GMO goats, producing antithrombin. Okay. This kind of technology, um, we use it all the time for many, many different things. Uh, so, for example, there's this protein that jellyfish use as a bioluminescence protein. That means it luminesces in, in the dark and glows. Well, you can actually take that protein and attach it to different molecules. And so we've done that. Um, we attach it and we can actually see uh, physiological processes at the molecular level with these tagged proteins that actually glow, bioluminesce. Um, we can use transgenic organisms for medicine, of course, for research, especially, it turns out, um, and then also for agriculture and animal husbandry and that sort of stuff. So we can engineer all kinds of these GMO organisms. Um, so cows have a, a growth hormone that they make. Um, and one thing that it does is it uh, initiates the amount of milk, it controls the, the amount of milk that's made. Well, of course, we want our cows to make as much milk as possible. So what we've done is we can, if we can get BGH, we can actually inject them with extra BGH and they'll make extra milk. Now, a question. Are these cows transgenic cows? Or are the bacteria that make the, the uh, bovine growth hormone the transgenic organisms? It's bacteria. So we're not doing anything to, the, to the, the cows. We're just adding more of the hormone so they'll not make more milk. So the bacteria are, all, are actually the transgenic or GMO organism.
Now, of course, I'm not sure how much, uh, if any extra BGH ends up in the milk. Um, but some people are really kind of um, uneasy about eating GMO organisms, like GMO corn or GMO wheat or whatever. Now, these, these organisms, these things that we, let's say, consume, they're the same things that we've always consumed. It's just that we've added traits to them. In the past, we've used what's called um, uh, selective breeding, okay? Which is um, selection on our part. The trouble is when we do selection by selective breeding over many, many, many generations, um, it takes a long time. And then it also commonly drags along other traits with it that we don't necessarily want. With this way, we can actually select the traits exactly as we want. Now, we're going to um, think about this, uh, I think when we get back um, from spring break, about GMOs and whether they're good or bad. A lot of people think, oh, they're not natural. You know, like uh, corn is natural, it, unless it's a, a transgenic corn, then it's not natural. Um, I just want you to understand that natural, well, poison hemlock is natural too. Uh, and you could eat that, and that'd be natural. And then you would have a natural death. Okay, so when we think about natural, we have to think about it a little bit more critically. Um,